Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. My name is Brandon. Today's video is going to be such a loose and discussion based, very light style of video. I actually have a couple topics that I would like to discuss. I think that they're very interesting and actually hopefully some very valuable and helpful topics. I want to discuss today five myths that investors will come across, they'll buy into, especially new investors when it comes to the stock market. And I want to bust those myths. A couple of them actually happen to be particularly related to Canadians, whether we do get to all five or not, because we're actually going to save that for the latter part of the video, because I did want to start today off with something a bit different and actually go over some of my portfolio management techniques that I've applied over the past quarter. And that's kind of like a very fancy name of saying it. I just want to share with you a couple of decisions that I made with my portfolio over the past couple of months. And this is something that I don't usually do. So I think it will be fun and kind of give you guys some insight into the decisions that I've made, the thought process that the thought processes that I've had with a couple of positions with the main goal of hopefully helping you guys. You may find yourself in a very similar position and you can draw on my decisions if you'd like and Hopefully that can help make you a better investor. What I want to first talk about today was why I decided to double down and go deeper into certain stocks and why I decided to avoid or not double down on another stock that I owned, even though they had both dropped very, very evenly. In fact, the stocks that I want to talk about today are the companies Raytheon. So you guys know I've covered them a fair amount on the channel. There have been one of my top picks as of recently. This was one of the stocks that I bought heavily into. Brookfield Asset Management was another one that I was very much liking and another stock that I uh, added to. And I even put here TD Bank, which I know is boring, but it's another good case scenario. Again, these were some of the stocks that I looked at that had done quite well since I had bought my next little batch of purchases. Relative to the stock Ovin Oventive, and this is the stock that had done poorly for me that I decided not to buy more of. And for those of you that don't know, Oventive is the only energy company that I own in my portfolio. I know everyone thinks I own uh, Suncor and Enbridge because we cover them so much. I don't own either of those stocks. In fact, Oventive is the only energy position that I have in my portfolio because I'm not a huge fan of energy. It represents, I think, I'd guess about 2%, maybe max, maybe even less, maybe one point something percent, but uh, yeah. Let's dive on into the thought process. By the way, just stick around for this video, grab a drink, grab a snack, kick the kick your legs up and drop a like if you do find this helpful at all or you like this type of video because yeah, it's going to be very much discussion style. Yeah. So, number point number 1 is that I think you all need to identify and this is something that I did very clearly was I identified the difference between a core company in my portfolio versus a non-core company or like a peripheral company or whatever you want to call it. Kind of just like a little complimenter. Because to me, when I looked at companies like uh, Raytheon, when I look at a company like Brookfield Asset Management, or of course a company like TD, which is a clear option of a core component to have in your portfolio, these are companies that I have so much confidence in, in the sense that uh, I don't even really need to look at them. I mean, obviously if something major changes, if there's some huge material uh, change that happens with the company that is cause for this uh, thesis and this idea to not work. But these are companies that I have a lot of confidence in. And I could see myself owning these stocks for the next 30, 40 years. Again, unless anything major changes. So when I saw these drops, a lot of them due to COVID, but they were down 30, 40% in and of themselves. There was no question that I would like to actually take advantage of that and go in and add into my positions. And off these lows, they've actually done quite well over the past uh, couple of months, let's call it, or you know, year to date, whatever we want to look at. They've all done quite well. I compare that to the company Oventive, which I do not consider a core component in my portfolio. You guys know me, and this is just my personal strategy. It doesn't have to be the case for you, but you know me. I'm not a major fan of a few major sectors. Gold happens to be one that I just am not a big fan of. Energy, again, very small component of my portfolio. And even real estate. I'm not the biggest fan of uh, owning real estate, despite Brookfield being a real estate play. But knowing that Oventive was kind of this peripheral part of my portfolio and I didn't have as much confidence in it, although they were both down 40%, I didn't feel comfortable going in and deploying more money and uh, 
you know, doubling down or averaging down on a company like Oventive, because what could happen there if you don't have the same level of confidence is that you could be throwing good money after a bad company. And the reality is uh, the thoughts that come to mind is, well, yeah, I own Oventive, but did I make a mistake in my research process? I don't think I did. I still think that these stocks are undervalued in the big picture. I, in fact, it's actually done, it's picked up well off lows, but the point being was, do I have that same level of confidence? There's no question that with my core stocks, uh, my ride or die stocks, actually Ian, PPC Ian, I believe, uh, I know he calls them his ride or die companies, companies that he would just ride or die with to the end. Oventive did not classify that for me. In fact, I'd be perfectly fine if somebody told me that this stock was kicked out of your portfolio, life would go on. So yeah, although they dropped in similar case scenarios, it wasn't a company that I wanted to double down on. But the other factor that came into mind, and this was actually more or less the main reason why I didn't want to go in and uh, buy more Oventive was that when I looked at the total composition of my portfolio and I looked at the total breakdown amongst the different sectors, the different industries and how they all relate to each other, the flat out answer is that I didn't want to have any more exposure to the energy sector. I bought this stock because I thought it was undervalued and I thought it would be a nice play. But at the end of the day, it's not an area that I want to be heavily weighted in my portfolio. So rather than looking at it, rather than looking at each stock individually and kind of being very, very focused on the stock, I think it's important sometimes to take a step back. Well, my brother, actually, I'll, I'll say a little quote that I heard from him. He said, stop looking at the trees or don't see the tree. Well, let me see what he said. Just, I'm going to butch this. Don't see the trees, see the forest. You know, you got to take a step back and see the forest sometimes because yeah, actually off lows of Intiv is up 455%. Some of you may say, well, you're a big idiot because you could have bought uh, this stock at the low point here and you've been up 455%. But the reality is when I looked at the rest of my portfolio and I said, well, how do I want my portfolio to be balanced? What are the caps that I want to have on each industry and sector? I was completely okay with passing up on that return because I felt more confidence putting it in different areas. And yeah, I, I'm kind of looping back to my original process there. But at the end of the day, did I want to put more money into the energy sector? For me, the answer was no. And gr granted, like what's great is when I did look at my question portfolio, Oventive had really picked up. This stock was my worst performer. It was down 40% at one point. And today, uh, today it was up or it was down 6%. So to me, that's like, it's still down a little bit, which is not the best, but from a 40% drop up to 6%, that's like, to me, that's like breaking even. And hopefully there's more room to run. Again, I actually think Oventive is a, a strong company. It's in a crappy industry that people don't like, and there's a lot of shade thrown there. But balance sheet wise, Oventive, I think is actually still undervalued. But that defeats the purpose. The main decision that I wanted to talk about and to summarize this point was that a, ask yourself, how much confidence do you have in a specific company? And if it's one of your core components, like a TD Bank or like a Raytheon, which I had more confidence in United Technologies, but I still very much like Raytheon or Brookfield. When you see these dips, take advantage of them, double down, drop more money into them, go heavier because by bringing your average cost down and uh, dollar cost averaging, I guess you could call it, that really helps with your recovery off these lows. With a company like Oventive, I was perfectly fine with letting it be because I didn't want to put more money in that sector, uh, didn't have as much confidence in it, and hopefully we could still check back in a number of years and it uh, still does well. But I think that's just more or less topic number one that I wanted to talk about. Understand that you don't want to just buy every single dip. You want to be very selective with the companies that you go in and it all boils down to confidence. But yeah, that's uh, topic number one for today's video. It sounded better on paper, but hopefully that gave you guys a little bit of insight. Maybe not, maybe not. Let's dive on into some stock market myths. And you can let me know if these are truly myths. Maybe these are just realities and I have it wrong. But these are things that in my opinion are clear myths. And I'd like to discuss that and hopefully bust some today. And you can leave a comment down below if you agree or disagree. But let's start with myth number one, which is that in the stock market, you can only invest money that you can afford to lose. This is something that I hear all too often. I hear it in the forums, I hear it in the Facebook groups, the chats, and I think that that's such poor advice. 
if you are a trader in the sense that you are taking on a very aggressive style of the stock market, you're approaching it with, you know, more risk, you want to be a little more aggressive, then absolutely, I think that's fair advice. You don't want to invest more than you can lose. You don't want to take your nest egg and drop it into certain stocks that you're going to be day trading with and swing trading with, because the numbers do suggest that majority of the time, that will come back to bite you in the butt. But if you're approaching the stock market as an investor, you can invest, you should absolutely invest more money than you can afford to lose because you should really have in general, in my opinion, aside from your immediate savings that you need for, you know, living like a slush fund or, you know, your checking fund that you need for day-to-day life. I would say that for the most part, you want to pop as much of your extra income, anything on top of that, uh, on top of your expenses, either to the stock market or something like real estate. And imagine telling a retired person, don't invest more than you can lose. And, you know, they have a million dollars invested in their, uh, in the markets, in funds or in stocks. They can't afford to lose that. That's what they're living off. That's what they're depending on. But I think you need to understand if you do buy into this myth is that, yeah, if you're going to be super aggressive and you're going to go all out and shoot for the stars, then of course you want to just take a portion that you're okay with losing and put that in the market. But if you're going to take a long-term approach and if you're going to be a good investor and actually buy assets, you're going to invest in assets, good assets, you can absolutely invest more than you can afford to lose. In fact, you should. You should invest majority of your money. That's what I would say. Myth number two is that compounding only works for young people and that it's too late to start investing. This is something that I hear for, in particular, you hear this a lot with people in their 40s and 50s, um, even sometimes the late 30s. And I know we have a big, that's a big demographic of our viewers. A lot of them will say when I do talk to them is, you know, I missed the boat and it's too late to start and there's no point at this point. Well, That is so, so false too. That's a big, big myth. Obviously, it goes without saying that the younger you get started, the better. Any type of compound interest graph would prove that because of the exponential growth and the earlier you can get into the market, the better. But if you were, let's say, 40 years old, well, let's take a look at that. Let's even take take a, a more extreme case. Let's assume you're 50 years old, right? Let's assume you're 50 years old. And you think, well, I want to retire by 65 or 67. So that's only 15 years out. Is that even enough time for me to compound my wealth? First of all, I would say that a 10 to 15 year period to begin with is a nice long-term period. If you take the rule of 72 or the law of 72, the rule of 72, which is basically a little tool where you can divide, I'll put it up on the screen. You can divide by your uh, compound return or your rate of return. And that'll give you, you divide it by the number 72 and you can get the number of years that it would take you to double your money. Very simple rule that you'll come across in the finance space. But if you took that rule and took a normal rate of return, 10 to 15 years is a very, very suitable time to grow your wealth. Now let's take it a step further and understand that even if you were 50 and you wanted to retire at 65, that doesn't mean that you just stop investing when you hit retirement. People think that there's this wall here and that, oh, when I hit retirement 65, I'm gonna sell all of my stocks and sell all of my mutual funds, sell all my investments, and I'm never gonna invest for the next number of years. That's not correct at all. Because if you at least are relatively healthy and you plan to live for another 15 to 20 years into retirement, let's hope, so into your 70s and 80s, Well, that actually just expanded your time horizon. It almost doubled it. It at least extended it because although you do have to shift the type of investments you make in retirement, you may, let's assume you're, uh, while you're working and you're contributing to your portfolio, you're going to more or less grow your portfolio in a balanced form, like a 60, 40 portfolio, whatever you want it to run with. Of course, when you stop working and you need to start drawing income, the investments within your portfolio may shift to more income producing to dividends and you know, GICs or whatever you decide is appropriate. Although you change the type of investments, you don't stop investing. You actually continue investing. And yeah, you may become more conservative and you may have to give up a little bit of growth, but to even compound and grow your wealth at a smaller rate of return, that f- that beats losing your money to inflation any day of the week. So the myth that you have to be young to benefit from compound interest is very uh, untrue at all. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go crazy if you're you know, 55 or 60 right now because that could 
you know, if you go buy Tesla stock and just try to go crazy, that could come back to bite you in the butt. But if you have a portfolio that is uh, suitable, it's well balanced for your own scenario, your own situation. Absolutely. I'd say compounding is better than, than no compounding. That would be myth number two. Number three is one that we've covered before, but I think it's a good one for today's video. And that is that the fees on US stocks are too high. And I use the example of Raytheon, which we covered earlier today. Raytheon's a stock that is obviously a US stock and I paid a conversion fee. I actually paid 2%, I believe it was, when I took my Canadian dollars and bought Raytheon. But I've already made from where I bought it 30, 40% gains on that position. So it makes my little 2% there seem quite meaningless, uh, quite meaning, yeah, quite meaningless. It's just a fraction of actually what I've made. And don't get me wrong, that that 30, 40% is just the beginning. We're gonna make a lot more money with that company going forward. You know, your first priority when it comes to investing, uh, if you're gonna be a good investor, is you put the investment first. Then you look secondarily at things like taxes and fees and where you can minimize. That's just an example that comes to mind, but think about back in the day when commissions were like 9%. I mean, this goes back way before my time. I have to go look up exactly what they were, but there are times, uh, even not too long ago on E-Trade and these other platforms where people were paying ridiculous amounts for commissions. It makes the 2% that we pay today seem so minor. And you could argue that, well, yeah, you know, you could go out of your way and, you know, exchange the dollars. You could go open up, a, open up a US dollar account to be as efficient as possible. And that may very well be the case for you. But for me personally, is it worth the effort? Is it worth the hassle? Not for me. I, that's kind of a, the lifestyle I like to live. I like to be efficient. I like to be you could call it unfrugal. You could you could argue, yeah, every, you know, you want to pinch every penny you can, but for the time to do, you know, a Norbert's Gambit and wait a couple of days to get this done or to, like I said, open up a US dollar account, that's just not for me. I'll pay the 2% fee and I'll go on to make 40, 50% on a stock. That's completely fine with me. But yeah, that's another one. Is that another myth? Is that fees on US stocks are too high? That would even apply for withholding tax, right? 15% withholding tax on your U.S. dividends deters so many people away from investing in a good U.S. company. They say, well, I don't want to touch that because they're withholding 15% of my dividend. Well, what if the other 85% of that dividend you get is superior, is better than a Canadian option? Well, you're looking at it like a bit of a silly person if you're looking at it that way because you need to look at the whole picture, not just be so focused on those little fees. But that's myth number three. Fees... They're a part of investing. You need to factor them in. But if you can make a good return somewhere else, they're just sometimes part of the process. Number four is that the uh, it's impossible to beat the market. You do hear that all the time. You hear that it's impossible to beat the market and that you always should just be a passive investor and that active investors, uh, let's just take mutual funds, for example. And this, this the numbers do suggest that if you, uh, a mutual fund in general, I believe it's about 80% of mutual funds, four out of every five funds, fail to beat the market. They fail to beat the passive index, the benchmark. And you would have been better off uh, if you had the choice to buy a mutual fund that's actively managed, meaning that they're you know making their adjustments and they're buying and jumping in and out of positions, trying to outperform the benchmark or the index. 80% of the time, you'd be better off to just go in and buy the index and ride that out because you're not incurring as many uh, transaction fees and you're, you can let your investments compound and there's a uh, taxes to factor in. There's a lot of things to factor in there. But I think that's a big, big myth that you can't beat the market. There's a couple of reasons why I believe that active managers, so somebody that is operating a fund, let's call it, struggle to beat the market. And I'll talk about those in just a second. But that doesn't mean that you and I as a retail investor have these same limitations on us or restrictions. Because if you think about it this way, one of the major things that uh, puts a damper on Let's just look at a mutual fund advisor, for example, like somebody that are a mutual fund uh, manager. So somebody that's running a mutual fund, they immediately from the start of the year, because of the fees, they the fees they charge, it's like they're starting in a hole of about two to 2.5%, right? So think about it that way. Let's assume the benchmark returned 10%. Let's assume the fund provider returned 10%. So that he actually did a great job at matching the uh, the index or the benchmark. But because there's a fee on top of that, the actual net return would drop down to 7.5% or yeah, my math right there, 7, 8% 
because of that fee. So in order for the active manager to actually outperform the market, they have to actually do just as good as the index plus beat the fee and that's charged year after year after year. So on a consistent basis, they have to be, let's call it 2% better at a minimum just to keep up with the index. That's one of the reasons why active managers really, really, really struggle to beat the uh, beat passive uh, index funds or beat the market, let's call it. A second reason that you have to keep in mind is that they also have a lot of pressure often to perform very well over short periods of time. They're not necessarily in it, I know this sounds crazy enough, even though you may be investing in a long-term fund, they may actually have short-term goals and quarter by quarter goals or even monthly goals or whatever the case is. For a fund to stay relevant and for a portfolio manager or even a hedge fund manager, anybody in the field to be, you know, make a name for themselves, they have to be those like standouts. They have to be stars and they have to take the appropriate risks to go out and, um, kind of excel, they have to go beyond the norm. And what comes with that often is, you know, they're chasing kind of the the shorter term performance. Again, they may, you know, be really uh, going for what's doing well this quarter, but that may not be the best move long term. So it's, they're under a lot of pressure, let's call it from Wall Street and from the rate, the analyst uh, companies, there's a lot of pressure that may influence the decisions they make, which may not be the best for the company's long term. And hey, they may do well this quarter, they may do well this year. In fact, a lot of stocks, uh, funds that you look at, they do really well one year. They're the best performer over the past year or two years. If you go out and buy those stocks at, at peaks, you end up uh, usually, they end up usually usually being pretty crappy after. I learned that firsthand, actually. I bought some mutual funds when I actually first started working here. I picked the star fund. It was the Fidelity fund that they said, this is a star fund, it's the best fund. I got sucked into it and I bought it and it was like the kiss of death, right? It was the... It ended up being the peak is where I bought it at. And that was a good good lesson for me that that's sometimes, that's often what happens. And the reverse is true often. A stock or a fund that's kind of been lagging, assuming the fundamentals are still strong, could actually be a good one to look into. That's something that I very much buy into. But yeah, um, to finish off that point, those are for people that have those restraints on them. For someone like you and I as the average investor, if we can identify companies that we believe are going to exceed the market or exceed the average, especially when you dive into individual stocks, when you go out and, you know, stray away from index funds or whatever the case is, you give yourself a lot of possibility. It does come with the risk, the downside too, rather than just playing the average, but you could very easily outperform the market, especially if you're buying in at good points with companies that you feel can outperform. There's a number of them out there, a number of them out there that you could pick from. Absolutely. It's possible to beat the market. There's no, no question about that. If you just buy an index, well, you're just taking the average of that, right? Whereas if you can identify even a couple stocks that you feel will outperform, if you even complement that up with your index fund, well, there you go. You can easily beat the market in that sense, uh, market being the, the average return that they get. In all honesty, I'm looking at this last point on this list and I'm not really feeling like uh, talking about it at the moment. It was that RRSPs are bad which is a myth that, it is a myth. You hear that all the time. RRSPs are bad and that you shouldn't be buying RRSPs and they conflict with your pension. And, and and there's some truth to that. But I don't think I want to talk about that in this video. And we are going to be coming up to RRSP season sooner than later as we are coming to year end. Actually, you know what? Let me throw in, let me throw in a good one while we're rolling. If you're still with us, this is off the cuff. This is, that, this is one that not even in my notes here, but I think it's actually a really good topic that I came across on the internet. If you're sticking around this far, drop a thumbs up. Let me know if you made it this far in the video because I feel like this is a long one. But rather than talking about RRSPs, let's talk about the myth that index funds, and I guess this does almost build off that last one that we talked about. Let's talk about the myth that index funds are better to own than individual stocks. It, it is different, actually. It is quite different when you look at it this way. But you do hear that. You hear people say, why would I buy individual stocks, take on that risk? You know, maybe you do have the chance to outperform the market, but you also put a lot of risk in, when you put money into a specific stock, there's a lot of concentrated risk. There's a lot of risk in that security. Why would you do that when you can just play the field? There's three options that come to mind as to why we can bust that theory in the sense that, number one, again, by buying individual stocks, you are giving yourself the potential to be better than average. If you're just gonna buy the S&P 500, you're gonna be average, you're gonna take that. Number one is that obviously by buying individual stocks, you have at least a chance. 
The second reason is that you, some people may like owning individual stocks because they want to be a direct shareholder. They want to be a shareholder of the company. Like some people have really close ties to, uh, especially take a company like Tesla or maybe a company in your local home or a company like Berkshire Hathaway, for example, is a great example where if you bought the stock directly, you have the rights to attend their, I mean, now they're done online, which I hope that's not the case going forward, but you can go to their annual shareholders. uh, You can go to their meetings you have the right to vote with certain companies and that may be another benefit to actually owning stocks directly. But the third reason, which is a very timely one right now, is that, and this is one that a lot of people don't think about, and this does happen more or less with high net worth investors. You'll see this more often with larger uh, portfolio sizes. When you own individual stocks versus index funds, you get a lot of flexibility when it comes to taxes, let's call it. And especially coming up to the year end, you will see this a lot. Um, Tax loss harvesting, you'll actually hear of, there's a bunch of tax strategies that you can implement where let's assume on a very base level, let's assume you had, and this wouldn't apply in a TFSA, just FYI. If you're dealing with a smaller amount of money, no disrespect, um, one day you'll get there, but you you can't um, trigger any tax, you can't can't trigger any capital losses in a TFSA or an RRSP for that matter, because those are registered, those are sheltered from tax to begin with. But in a cash account or in a margin account, let's assume you had a stock that did really well and you've made a $100,000 gain on that position. So it's that's your profits right there. If you were to sell that because you need to redeem some money, you, have, you are subject to paying capital gains tax. You have to take 50% of that gain and include that as part of your taxes. That's just what's considered the capital gains, ta- gains tax. Again, only in a margin or taxable account. If you have a stock, let's say Oventive, let's take the stock Oventive that you had, which we had done very, very poorly. If that stock was actually down and you've actually have a loss on that position, if you sell that stock for a capital loss, that can actually offset the gains. So let's assume you sold that stock. Let's assume it did very terrible and you sold, you lost $40,000 on that position. Well, that could actually cut into your capital gain. And now your capital gain, rather than being 100,000, would be 60,000. And then you would take half of that and then include that for uh, the appropriate taxes. But when you have individual positions like that, you do have a lot of flexibility. You have more flexibility than if you were just playing a broad-based ETF. It can still be done, don't get me wrong, but you most definitely have more room to work with when you are dealing with individual securities. So uh, actually a strategy, and I actually saw this in Ryan's video recently, which actually, that's what sparked up this video. Ryan Scrivener, I'll give a shout out to that video. But another very popular example is, let's assume Oventive had performed very poorly and you've lost $40,000 on that position. If you were to sell that stock and buy a very similar stock, um, let's just say you believe that the energy sector has been beaten down and that there's they're in general undervalued. If you were to sell that stock, you'd trigger your capital loss. You could go buy a brand new stock and hope to play out the recovery, but you'd still trigger that capital loss. That's something that you can use very, very valuably, actually not even in this year, even going forward and actually carried back. But that's a topic for another video. If you guys would like to see that, I can do a full deep video. That may be actually a really good topic for a video. Um, strategies for non-registered accounts for anybody that is in that situation or people that will at some point down the road get there. But that is just a couple reasons that come to mind for our impromptu fifth myth that index fund investing is always better. It's not always better. It depends on your specific case. I do believe that for a lot of people, ETFs and index funds are the way to go based on their lifestyle and based on how much time and uh, commitment they want to have to managing their own portfolio. But for a lot of people out there, take someone like myself. I started with index funds or mutual funds, and I've slowly delved into owning individual stocks because I like everything that comes with it. But that is it for today's video, guys. What do you think of this style of video? This was so fun. I had so much fun just just chatting and definitely less structure, albeit definitely more sloppy. It's kind of what comes with it, but I thought that was actually really, really fun. And if you guys, you guys can let me know. Uh, Is it too loose? Is it too, you know, sometimes like right now, I can't even come up with the right words and that I know can be very annoying and stuff. So yeah, 
Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below, but hopefully throughout this video, you did learn something new. Hopefully you got some value that you will be able to incorporate into your own investing practice because that's really the point of this video and that's really the point of this channel. So if you guys enjoyed, do give this video a thumbs up. I really, really appreciate all of the support and uh, subscribe for more content. We post videos like this every week and do hit the bell for notifications. That way when I make a post, you'll be notified. And then as always, Last but not least, we do have our investing academy. So if you are uh, an investor or if you're new to the stock market or you need help or you know you want just to run, you, yeah, if you're looking for courses and training on the do-it-yourself style of things and making sure you're doing things the right way, click the first link in the description below and you can learn all about that. But as always, I thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next video.